Hello everyone, it is time for this week's live stream, and I'm right on time, like exactly to the minute, for once. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about quarantine tanks today. The last couple of weeks, um, we've just been, you know, haphazard in what we're picking to talk about. Hey Bill, so good to see you. You are first. Good job. Oh my goodness, these uh, chats are like this big on my screen for some reason. Let me change the size of that box. Of course, I could see it from a distance. That's convenient. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it doesn't need to be quite. I mean, you guys are like headlines on a newspaper. You know what that is? Anyway, <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about quarantine tanks because many of you like to buy new things. And when you're buying those new things, you end up with taking a chance that you're... It's called uh, dump and pray. Have you heard of that saying? If you haven't, it's real. So basically you dump in the new thing and you pray everything's going to be fine, which is really not a safe method when it comes to reef keeping. And so we always emphasize the importance of dipping, quarantining, but a lot of people don't do it. And one of the main reasons I usually hear it, well, there's a couple of good reasons, uh, good excuses why not to quarantine. Number one, it costs money. I don't have the extra money. Okay, that's the first excuse. Okay. Number two is I don't have anywhere to put it. There's just no room for it. I, I have nowhere to put an extra tank. And uh, number three, everything I put in quarantine dies anyway. They do have a better chance of living inside my reef tank. So I'm, I'm not going to argue that point because that one is kind of valid, but it would be better if you didn't do that. Okay, this camera looks slightly crooked. It's going to drive me crazy the whole video. So let me tilt that a little bit more. Let's see if that does. And if I back up slightly, see if it can find me. There we go. All right. So um, if you can, let's talk about money. Uh, it doesn't cost a lot to set up a quarantine tank. And sometimes you can reuse things you already own or systems you used to run because you upgraded to something bigger. So there's that chance. But ideally, you want to go ahead and just have the, uh, the, the smallest tank that will fit your scenario that's still big enough for the livestock. So if you were buying tangs and they were like medium-sized fish, you're going to need to look at something that's probably a 40 to 55 gallon aquarium for quarantine. That's a lot. But when you've got smaller fish, then you can get away with like a 10 gallon or a 20 gallon because it's just temporary. It's just a few weeks. So do you have room for a 10 or 29, a 20 gallon or 29 gallon in your home? Probably you actually do. Uh, it might be able to fit right next to the aquarium to off to the side. Uh, some people like to put them on the kitchen counter where they can observe them over there. Uh, there might be a guest room. I mean, there's always somewhere. It can happen, but you have to maybe rearrange your life a little bit to make it work. So we're trying to find a spot for it and we're trying to keep it inexpensive. Uh, Petco, I believe, no longer does the dollar gallon sales, but they are marking them down from time to time. And then, of course, there's Facebook Marketplace where you can buy used aquariums and you might find something that you like that you could go ahead and uh, you know acquire for an inexpensive price. So if we could get a, uh, like, a, let's just stay with a 20 gallon. A 20 gallon long would be pretty nice for most new acquisitions. They're not big. I believe they're between 20 and 30 inches long and about 10 by 10. I mean, it's just it's a small, long aquarium, which is good for a fish that needs to swim the length of a tank. So that's a benefit. It doesn't hold a lot of water, which means you're not changing a lot of water. A 10% water change on a 20 gallon tank is two gallons. So it's not even a lot of water, but quarantine tanks do require water changes regularly. And so we wanna make sure that we can keep up with that demand because it is an extra burden during the process of dealing with a new fish that is in that tank. Um, you're gonna need some kind of a simple light. There's tons of LED fixtures out there. It's not gonna have to be anything special because it's temporary and you don't need to leave the lights on all day long. The fish don't care. So if they're in a room and the lights are, and the, it's getting ambient light. I mean, this fish over here has been swimming all morning <laughs> in Caitlin's Reef. The light doesn't come on till three o'clock in the afternoon. It turns off again around 10 o'clock. It's not on that long and it's, you know, the afternoon evening, which is what I appreciate, but that doesn't stop the fish from coming out and swimming. So don't uh, feel like you need lights on from like 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. or some crazy duration that is super long because you don't, especially in a quarantine tank. We're not trying to grow algae. We're just trying to see 
the livestock and make sure it's healthy and eating. So if you had a routine like I always feed at seven o'clock at night, you could have the light come on at six and turn off at eight, for example, just a couple of hours. That would be fine. And now you could really study the fish. If you want to be on a little bit longer, like from five to nine, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with running lights. It's just you have to clean the glass more, a little more frequently. And while you're doing that, um, you know, you've added yourself an extra job. I'm trying to make this as simple as possible. Glass box, light, filter. So there's different kinds of filters. Uh, you know, there's the kind old school. It fits in the corner of the tank. An air stone goes inside it. You fill it up with floss and carbon. And it just, the bubbles make water flow through the carbon to help purify the water and help clean it up some. Uh, maybe a more effective filter would be a hang on back filter. Doesn't have to be expensive. Something from Marine Land, whatever Petco brand is being sold now. Uh, there's the new Cobalt uh, Shark Pro that fits inside an aquarium. I mean, lots of different options. Some kind of a filter that hangs on the tank and uh, just processes water to, cl to clear the water, to make the water not look green. Or, uh, you know, how you know when you drain water from water change and the water looks tinted, but your brand new water is nice and clean. We want to get the tinted, you know, lower the tint level, okay? Want to keep the water looking good. You're going to definitely need a thermometer because you want to know the temperature of the tank. And of course, with a thermometer, you need a heater, especially if you head into winter. And uh, I'm sure all of you are keeping up with the weather, but in case some of you are not, check the weather forecast for the next week so you can prepare. And this is not to do a quarantine. So you can prepare in case your tank is going to need some extra TLC. I noticed that our weather next Thursday is going to be 12 degrees. So I want to make sure that my generator works, that I have gasoline just in case something weird happens with the power. A little bit of preparation. Okay, back to the tank. So you've got glass box, hang on back filter, thermometer, heater, light. Do you need anything else? Really for quarantine you don't, but you may choose to put some rock in there. And it wouldn't be live rock, it'd probably be dry rock, just some rock you never care about that will never, ever, ever go into your aquarium. Okay, this is sacrifice to the quarantine tank for the life of that tank. And the reason being is that if anything were to come off your new livestock and get into that rock, and you took that rock and put that in your tank one day because you're like, oh, I like that shape, I can use that, you might move a pest into your aquarium that was doing great out of the aquarium. So let's make sure we protect our tanks from those kind of pests that rock will just stay in that quarantine tank forever. If you wanted to pull it out and you wanted to literally put it through bleach and sterilize the rock to start fresh, that rock will be in, then you put it through another thing of RO water, you put in some prime to lock up any kind of ammonia, you leave it in the, you know, the air to air out for a day or so and to bleed off any ammonia. Then you can put it back in your quarantine tank and get the tank running again. All right, so that's all the ingredients you need. And if you don't want to use rock, you could use PVC fittings. Some people will stack PVC pipes and zip tie it together into a pyramid for skinny fish to swim through. Others who use larger fittings like elbows and tees for the fish to go inside or to swim out a hole. Just a little bit of safety, a little bit of feeling like I could call this home if you were a fish. And you know, if they're scared, they have somewhere to retreat to and they're not just pacing the tank constantly because they're stressed. We don't want stressed fish. We want nice, calm, happy fish because the calmer the fish is, the less likely you're gonna have a, a fish disease problem versus a stressed fish, it's, it's well, stressed. And it's gonna go ahead and it could burst out in all kinds of issues. Now, does that mean you should put the fish through stress to make it reveal its disease? No, no, no. Should you throw medication in there immediately? Actually, no, I don't recommend that. I would think you would wanna know what the problem is first. What if? You just walked in the hospital and didn't say anything. And the doctor says, oh, I'm going to put you in this room. I'm going to put you on cancer meds immediately. And all you have is a headache. See? Wrong choice. So we want to make sure that we are using the right medica medication for the right issue. And you may not see that issue for a while. We want to give it some time to um, become vis visible. So how long should a fish be in quarantine? Usually I like to say about two weeks to three weeks where you just observe it, you feed it regularly, and then if nothing weird seems to appear and it looks healthy and it's active, at that point you can then carefully move it into your reef tank. If um, after two or three weeks you suddenly start seeing patchy areas, a weird red splotch on its body, if you were to see ick, um, if you saw it scratching against your rock or against PVC, it might have velvet. 
All these things happened in the quarantine tank and did not get into your reef, which is a very good thing. And that, and at that point, you could go to Humblefish, which is a website, Humblefish, humble.fish. Just hit that in Google and you will find it. And he will answer any question you have about fish disease and how to treat it. And since that fish is in a quarantine tank, it's not gonna be something you have to tr you know, capture. It's already there, which is ideal. And he will probably tell you, you need another tank. <laughs> That'll be the hospital tank because your quarantine is quarantine, your hospital is for the meds. But maybe you can do all of it inside the quarantine and you know get away with it, which is doable. And then when you're all done and you've killed off this plague, then you could go ahead and you could restart the tank. You could clean it up with vinegar and water or peroxide and water and just really purify everything and start fresh. All right. One more thing to keep in mind when it comes to a quarantine tank that we want to not forget is that you want to be able to have it set up and running before you come home with that new fish in a bag. If you walk in the door and say, okay, I'm going to set up the quarantine, that's a terrible decision. Uh, it's just, it's too sudden. There's the, the biological cycle doesn't exist in the tank. So we want to set up the quarantine in advance. There are some techniques that can speed things along. Uh, one of them would be to keep a sponge of some kind floating in your sump of your aquarium or in the hidden compartment of an all-in-one tank just so it fills up with bacteria. Then when you set up your new quarantine tank, you would take that sponge out of your sump or your, your back area of the all-in-one and you'll put it in the quarantine tank to establish some bacteria in that tank and then give it a week or two before you actually put the new livestock in there. And then should you keep it running all the time? Well, that's going to be between you and your spouse. <laughs> I would say, yes, always have it running because you just never know when you're going to impulse buy. What if your spouse surprises you with something and you had the quarantine put away in the closet and they come home with this livestock and you're like, oh, what do I do now? And then you're like, dump and pray. It goes in the reef tank because you weren't prepared. So keeping the quarantine running all the time would be ideal. It doesn't have to be heated the whole time. It doesn't have to. All it needs is top off. The top off is what is going to maintain the salinity in that tank. And other than that, it can just be running all the time. And then when you're ready to put new livestock in, you could change the filter on the hang on bike filter. Uh, you could do a water change. Uh, you could you know, plug in the heater. You know, there's certain things you can do, but when it's just an idle mode, you can kind of shrink it down to the absolute basics. No lights, probably no heat, unless your house is crazy cold. Um, and then just top off. That's really important. And what about while the fish is in the tank? What do you have to do to keep it alive? mostly it's going to be water changes because while you do have a hang on back filter, it's not the full on full blown filter that we're so used to with our reef tanks. This is going to be something that's more simplified. And so usually it's best recommended that you change 10% of the water daily during the quarantine period while the fish is in the tank. So if you came home with a hippo tank and you have a 20 gallon long and the hippo tank is this big, just cute, right? So it's nice and small. You can go ahead and put that in there and then you're going to feed the tank for the tang to eat and some of the food's going to go on the bottom and maybe it doesn't get consumed. So if you're doing a daily water change of pulling out two gallons of water out of that 20 gallon tank, you could siphon out all the fish waste and all the excess food that wasn't eaten, which helps the water stay cleaner longer. And you just do this each day. And if you were to, you know, 10 days, you've done hundred percent water change. So it's a, uh, it's a nice system to keep the water clean and healthy. So your fish doesn't get sick from bad water. If um, you had the money and you wanted to go a little bit high end, you could actually set up automatic water changes for your quarantine tank. And you know, the Auto Aqua has that gizmo, it's three, $400, but you could set it up with jugs of salt water next to the tank and empty jugs for the wastewater. And it could be pumping some water out at night and pumping new water in and you wake up and the water change's already done. And then from time to time, you're emptying out the dirty uh, water jugs and you're putting clean water jugs near the tank again. But that would be major overkill, and most people are not going to do that. You know, we just, you need to interact with your quarantined fish. Now, when it comes to corals, it's so much easier than fish. Because with corals, they don't have nearly the demands fish do, other than they want some light and they want clean water. But you're not going to be feeding the tank nonstop. So you're not going to be polluting it. And you can put cor corals in there, and they'll just idle just fine no matter what is going on with the system, unless you really let it get away from you. So let me talk about what I've done with corals, with a quarantine tank in the past, to help maybe paint the picture so it makes a little more sense in your mind. 
uh, I go to the fish store and I'm determined I'm not going to buy anything. Not buying anything. I just need some fish food and I'm going home. And you walk past the frag tank. You're like, oh my God, that is so pretty. I need that. And you know you're about to go do something that evening. You got things to do tomorrow. You got work all week. You're just like, ugh. So if you have a quarantine tank set up, you can come home with that coral. You can float it in the quarantine tank for 20 minutes. And then you can go and open the bag and put it in the tank and ignore it. <laughs> you don't have to do anything. Just leave it there. It's there for observation. You can use a nice bright light. You can use white light, which is ideal, to study it and look if there's any kind of pests. Uh, if you are not even in this position right now other than get it home and in water and you can't even dip it, that's why you have a quarantine tank. So it's in there. And if uh, it's zoanthids or it's an SPS or it's an LPS, whatever, just put it in there. And if something vile is on there, it'll crawl off into the quarantine tank. You might see it on the glass. You might see it on the rock. You might see it on the PVC. You might see it on the frag rack, whatever you're using. And you can siphon that out while you're doing your water change. So it's no big deal. But ideally... You would come home with your new frag, you would put it through a, whatever, seven to 15 minute dip, whatever you're using, and then put it in the quarantine tank and leave it alone. Get your hands off of it. It's already been handled by the store, it's been in a bag, it's bounced around the back seat, and then you come home, you handle it, you put in chemicals, and then you put it in the frag tank, leave it alone. I'm sorry, quarantine tank, leave it alone. And I've done that. I have left corals in the quarantine tank for a week or two with just the light on a timer that comes on for like seven hours a day, and I would just like, yeah, I really need to move those in my tank. I need to glue those down. I need to do this. I'll do it soon. And it just kind of idled. And they did not get any worse during that period because the tank itself was nice, good water, and I was topping off automatically. So if you do that, you, you'll find it super easy. And then, you know, if you have, like I said, you have the impulse, you want to get something, you got a place to put it immediately when you get home. And you don't have to worry about getting up on the ladder and getting in your reef tank and finding a spot and bolting it down. And uh, it, it's a really smart system. And then, for example, if you run into a big problem with a very specific pest, for example, let's say you found zoa, zoanthid, spiders in your tank, in your display. Well, they live and breed on zoanthids. So if you were to take all of those out of your tank and put them in that quarantine tank, you could literally observe them daily and with a hose, uh, a small hose, some kind of airline tubing or maybe a little bit larger, you could, every time you spot one, you could siphon it out. And this takes like 90 days. So you literally go through the whole process of looking daily, sucking out any adults you can, wait for babies to hatch and be born and reveal themselves and keep siphoning until they're all gone and you can't find any. And then you move all your zoas back into your reef. Your reef has been zoa free. So any spiders that may have been in the system They've died off from lack of food, and you can put your zoas back in and solve the problem once and for all. So having that quarantine tank is super convenient and highly recommended. Uh, my last quarantine tank was 14 inches by 14 inches by maybe 16 inches tall. Just an acrylic cube, so to speak. It had about 14 inches of water in it. There's about this much space around the top. And I rigged a weird acrylic bracket to dangle a floodlight from Home Depot, and that was my light. Uh, you want to make sure, I didn't mention this before, so I'm glad you're still listening. Uh, the heater you put in the quarantine tank should match the water volume of the quarantine tank. You do not want to have a 20-gallon long with a 200-watt heater. That's insane and very dangerous because you could cook everything you, you bought because it, made, it, it failed. And usually they fail in the on position. So 20-gallon tank, 3 watts per gallon. You need like a 60-watt heater, 50-watt heater, at the most a 75-watt heater. We don't want to use too much wattage. And uh, if you could have it plugged into something like an Inkbird controller or the Cobalt uh, heater controller I showed you guys on the Instagram live stream a couple days ago, at least you're limiting the risk of the tank overheating. In the summer, you're, if you were doing a quarantine tank, you know, let's say we fast forward six months, now it's blazing hot and your house is warm. Where the quarantine tank is, it really gets warm. You may need to cool that tank so you could have a cooling fan that blows down on the water, which will increase evaporation. You have to top off more frequently. Or you could float 20 ounce frozen bottles in there during the peak of the day every afternoon. And you keep putting those bottles back in the freezer, get them rock hard, put them back inside the tank, let them melt. And it'll just kind of keep the temperature from rising two, three degrees. It'll kind of stabilize it. And I used to have to do that with a little tiny Pico I had on my kitchen counter. I think it was the lights I used were just creating so much heat every day, but I had a clam in there, 
and I had zoanthids and I had a seahorse and that little tank just wanted to warm up. So I used the frozen bottle trick and it worked great. And uh, you can just keep recycling the bottles. Always keep one in the freezer and put one in the tank and then swap. And I'm only talking about during the time of day you need it. Don't leave them in the tank all the time. If you put it in at two o'clock by 2.30, it's probably melted. Time to take it out. Do you need another one in there right now or is that it for the day? That's what you want to determine and you have to figure that out. Um, that's really everything there is to know about quarantine tanks. They're easy. Now, let's talk about the third point. Everything I put in there dies, so I don't do it. I'd rather just put it in the reef because they do better. People have said that. I can't really disagree with that because I've encountered it myself. Certain fish just don't do well in quarantine, and it happens to all of us. If any of you are following, following Polo Reef, the man with a ginormous reef tank in his home, he set up, he has this fantastic quarantine laboratory, and he filled it up with, um, I think he said, this is one section of the huge quarantine system. This one section, he had, I think, 20 of the Tuca Antheus. The purple ones, they're gorgeous. And like uh, two days later, he updated it. Like one survived out of 20. He says, I'm never buying these fish again. So there is a chance things you buy will not make it. It doesn't mean your quarantine tank was bad. It could have been bad from the get-go. Like where it came from the wholesaler in the first place, it, they were already doomed. You never know. But uh, if you are buying fish from a store and having more losses than uh, successes, you might want to buy fish from a different store and just see if you have better luck because that is a real thing. And uh, you know, it's, it just is what it is. It might be the way they're, they're uh, acclimating the fish. It could just be the system that they're in. I don't know what causes that, but I've encountered it myself and I just stopped buying fish from that store. And I, I bought corals and I bought test kits and I bought fish food because that was fine but I'd buy fish from another place. And, uh, you know, I want, what in a perfect world, every fish I buy, I want to live forever. You know, I don't want any losses ever. I don't even want them to die in my tank. I mean, I just want them to be forever. I purchased this, I spent my money, I'm going to keep it alive, I'm gonna love it, I'm gonna pet it, I'm gonna call it George. And that is just how it is, but unfortunately, reality is life can throw you curveballs. And sometimes fish will die because of they're collected. Uh, it could be what happened through all the handling. It could be what happened once um, they were in your care. It, there's multiple people that can be blamed in the food chain uh, or the supply chain, I should say. So we want to make sure that we are definitely doing our best. And that also could be applied to people that walk into like a Petco and they go in the saltwater section and they see something that looks really sick, really unhealthy. And some people say, I'm not buying fish from them if that's what they look like. That's the first uh, viewpoint. Others will say, oh my God, that poor animal, I'm going to rescue it and bring it home. Well, if you're gonna rescue it, rescue it in a quarantine tank and give it a lot of TLC and maybe you'll be lucky and you'll be able to turn things around and you make it healthier to where you could introduce it to your reef and continue to watch it heal. Some fish can take years to get better. I remember many, many years ago when I bought my 55 gallon used, it came with a coral beauty and half of its face was just erased. I mean, it was just, it was, it just looked wrong. And the tank had nitrates of 200, all the rock was green. And when I flipped all the rock over, I said, took it out, they were all covered in corally. <laughs> they were all beautiful on the other side. I was like, wow, okay. Anyway, I did a monster water change. I set up the tank, I changed the filtration. I put metal halides over the tank. You know, I did the whole thing like you do with a reef tank and then I noticed like six or nine months later, that coral beauty was perfect. And you know, I didn't know, I didn't, I wasn't thinking it would get better. I was just thinking, I want you to be healthy and happy. And I'm sure on some level, I might've caught out of the corner of my eye, it looked a little bit better, but I didn't really notice until like that six month mark or nine month mark. And I was like, wow, that whole side of the face is like completely recovered, like healed. It was amazing. And I was really happy about that. So. You can rescue fish, but ideally you want to put them into that quarantine tank. One additional perk to having a quarantine tank for new fish versus just dropping them in the reef, because we're kind of dancing back and forth in that third point, is that when you put them in their own tank by themselves with no competition or the competition of whatever fish you bought that day, let's say you bought three fish, they all go in quarantine. Um, so there's three fish in that tank, not your whole reef full of 24 other fish. 
when it's time to feed, there's just three in that tank. There's not this frenzy to gobble up all the food so everyone gets a chance to eat. And you can observe if those three or one, whatever, if you want one fish, two fish, three fish, you can observe each one and see are they eating or are they not. You can try different foods to find that, that sweet, perfect menu that will make that fish eat and put on weight and be healthy so that when it's time to move it into your reef, it's already acclimated to the foods you use. That way when you, let's, let's just take, um, you have an antheus and you're feeding it flake food, for example, let's say that works. And you're putting that flake food in. Well then when you put the antheus in your reef with all the other fish and you put in flake food, it's gonna immediately say, I know what that is. And it'll dart after some of the crumbs and eventually, in a week or two, you're going to see it's going to join in with everyone. It's going to be right in the middle of the food bowl. And it's going to be going at it left and right. Or it might even come over to the feeding clip and start eating nori next to a tang. I mean, these things happen because they get more comfortable. But we want to make sure the transition from fish store to your reef has a good middle point. All right. So now let's talk about Mark. Why doesn't Mark have a quarantine tank right now? Uh, I've been lazy. I admit that. But I... Um, I've been using Safety Stop with every new fish for the last, well, 12 years. Ever since that stuff came out, I was like in love with it because it's a two-part medicated bath. It's, you come home with your fish, you acclimate it to your water outside of the tank, and then you put it in one gallon of part A of Safety Stop for 45 minutes, and then you put it in one gallon of part B of Safety Stop for 45 minutes, and then it's ready to go into, quarantine tank would be best, but if you need to, you can put it in your reef. But in my case, I always put it inside the Peacemaker. So the Peacemaker is that acrylic box that has a bunch of holes drilled through the sides. And I hang it inside my tank, sitting on the, the front and back of my Euro bracing. And the fish is in there, right up here, nice and high, where I can observe it. And there's a lid on top, so the fish can't jump out. And then when I'm feeding, I always take a pipette. And when I feed, I've been doing this forever and I will squirt some food through the hole of the lid into the peacemaker so that fish has a chance to eat and then I pour the rest in the tank so all the other fish are eating, hoping that the fish in the box won't be freaked out by all this activity and will recognize there's food in the water column. Hey, there's food in my box, I will eat some of this. And then after three days, I will release it into my, into my system. But in 2023, I've been talking about this horrible frag tank of mine for years. And actually, it's doing quite well, but it's still a problem, and I'm going to break it down and build a new tank. And when I build a new tank, I'm going to build a frag tank smaller so I can have a quarantine tank next to it that will fit on the same stand. And this way, I will have my quarantine tank always operational. I'll have my frag tank to the side of it. Maybe I'll put the quarantine tank in the corner. I don't know. I, I've been picturing the quarantine tank as you walk in the fish room, and then behind it, going to the wall, would be the frag system with a drain going down to a, a sump that is just for the frag system. The quarantine tank will not be part of it, but it will have its own top off to replace water being evaporated automatically. And I'm running two radions. So one radion can be right over the quarantine tank and then one can be over the frag tank. And um, I might switch the radion to off or limit the lighting to one hour a day or something. I don't know what I'll do with that exactly because right now it's all programmed. It just does its thing every day and I never think about it. But it will be standalone and yet easy to reach and always available. And when I get my new stuff, I can put it in there. So when I come home with new frags or I come home with new fish or whatever it is, like, or something that's delivered to me, it will definitely go into that quarantine tank first. And then it'll move, migrate into my reef tank. And I'll be setting a wonderful example for you. <laughs> and um, also, I can kind of demonstrate how simple it is. Um, I don't believe I will make it over the top. The tank itself will probably made a 3 8 acrylic because the frag tank will be as well, so they match when they look side by side. But um, yeah, there won't be anything crazy special about it, so it won't look like, oh, Mark just spent eight, made an made $800 quarantine tank. That's not going to happen. I will still keep it in the affordable level and utilize the things I own and you know make everything the correct size for that box. So that is my topic for today. See, I'm done. How did we do on time? All right, 30 minutes. I like it. That's what I wanted. So now we can start answering some of your questions. Ah, somebody asked, does a safety stop expire? I've had five or six packets for three years. As far as I know, it cannot expire. I believe they did put a date on the packages when they went to Canada. But now, uh, because of law in Canada, safety stop can't be sold there. 
So that was the only reason there was a date put on there is because it was demanded by the government. But one part of safety stop, the first part, the green part, is uh, formalin. And then the second part, the blue stuff, is methylin blue. And those are products that don't go bad. So you would still be able to use ones you have. They don't spoil. All right, let me scroll way up because I ignored all the chat while I was staying focused on the camera. I've got the camera right next to the chat so my eyeballs don't have to like do this whole thing where I look off camera forever. Oh, thank you, Spencer. Spencer reminded me of the size of a 20-gallon uh, long, 30 by 12 by 12. All right. That was actually the very first size tank I had as a kid. Adam says, could you please talk a little bit about the best way to move fish and corals, specifically a move that requires at least one overnight in transit? Yeah, sure. In, in those scenarios where you're trying to move livestock, like you're moving from one state to another, or you're going to be going across a huge state like Texas and you want to stay in a hotel, or you're staying with a friend, you've got, you need your livestock to be able to come indoors with you and not stay in your vehicle. The ideal scenario would be coolers, with, uh, with bags with oxygen, not just air, but oxygen pumped in the bags like some fish stores will do. Other stores just use compressed air. But there are some stores that literally offer oxygen for long transportation. And these bags will stay sealed the entire trip, even though it's going to be more than, you know, a, it's going to be like a 24-hour move, including a stay over in a hotel or a friend's house, you know, for eight hours. But you would bring that cooler inside. So if you have your livestock, bagged up like that, like I'm describing, you would then want to put tape around the edges of the cooler completely so that no air can leak out. You, In this time of year, you would be putting heat packs in there. In the summer, I wouldn't think you'd need any heat packs. You might need a, a, a cold pack, but let's just say we're doing it in winter. So you're going to have heat packs, and they should be taped to the lid on the inside of the cooler, not the outside. Uh, I've seen that recently, and I don't understand why anyone put a heat pack on the outside of the cooler you need the temperature of the livestock inside to stay stable around 76 to 78 degrees. So normally the heat pack, which are those pocket warmers, you open them up, you shake them to get the dust mixing and it warms up. And after about 15, 20 minutes, it's ready. Then you can roll it up in some kind of paper or newspaper or magazine pages or whatever, and then tape that to the lid on each end. So the heat pack is emanating heat downward, right? But you don't want to tape it so well that you've sealed the heat pack inside a bubble of the lid. You want to affix it. You just don't want the heat pack to lie on a bag and warm up the bag. Okay? So now you've got your lid on top. You put tape around it. You put the cooler inside a box. You tape the box shut. Now it is cocooned the best you can for travel. You carefully carry it by hand. Put it in a vehicle. And ideally, livestock should be in the cab with you, not in the tailgate of a truck or... Um, in, in a box truck in the back with, where furniture goes because the temperature will be much colder in there in the winter, much hotter in the summer. It's better to have it in the cab where you have climate control and you're keeping the, in the area where you drive 70 degrees or so, 65 degrees, and you're staying comfortable. And that way the livestock doesn't have much of a change of outdoor temperature to affect it. Then you get to your destination for the night. You bring those livestock inside. Uh, listen, I have gone, I've done this so many times over the years, you're talking about overnights. I'm just talking about just going from the club meeting. I won some frags. I put them in my little soft cooler and then they said, hey, we're going to the burger place afterwards to grab a drink. And I'd bring my soft cooler inside the bar with me and put it next to me on the chair. <laughs> and my little baby stayed in there because I didn't want them to cool off in the car for an hour or two before I start my drive home, which was another hour. That's three hours. So I kept them with me. And sometimes, you know, they say what's in there, and sometimes they didn't care. But, uh, yeah, always bring your livestock with you. And if you're invited to someone's house for dinner and you've got this coral, bring it inside with you. Just find a spot. Keep it there. Don't forget it when you leave. And then head out. And then the next day, you know, if you know you're going to be there in the next seven to nine hours, don't open the cooler yet. You know, you might be inclined to, I want to check on them. It's just better to leave a cocoon just if it was being shipped cargo from the other side of the world. Now, if you're not doing what I described with the bags and the oxygen, and you're just doing bags with air, or you're doing Ziploc containers with lids, that's a little bit different. And in those scenarios, you might actually want to go ahead and cut the tape, lift the lid, possibly for the night, 
you might do something different. You might plug in a heater and lay it in the cooler with water and corals and an air stone. And literally, it's a little temporary portable aquarium. But then the next day, you got to basically package everything up again and uh, drain out the last of the water out of the cooler. You know, of course, put the heater away and all that kind of stuff. So that is another approach that could work. Um, the corals, we want them to be separated, not touch each other usually. Um, as I'm thinking this through, I mean, all these crazy ideas pop into my head because I've seen so many things at Frag Swaps. Like there are companies, I, I haven't done it yet, but companies make these trays that can hold frags that have legs with another tray and legs and another tray, and they put them in a bucket. And I was just thinking, man, if you had all your frags on there, but they'd have to be frags, you know, not decent sized corals. But if you had that, that'd be super easy to plug in when you get to your destination with a heater and some kind of a small CJ power head and just go ahead and keep circulation overnight, leave the lid on top, keep the condensation inside there. And then the next day, unplug it and seal the lid and get in your vehicle and keep driving. But fish, on the other hand, they need air. So if you're not able to bag those up with oxygen, like I described, then you are going to want them to be in a container where you have an air stone in them. And that, and again, if you're bringing it inside for the night, that one could have, you could put a heater in the container with the fish and the air stone. While you're driving, you could have one of those battery powered air pumps with a tubing going inside to the bin full of water and fish. So you've got different ways to keep the water oxygenated and to kind of control that temperature. But you also have to consider, will it slosh while you're driving? Will it spill out? Will you have enough towels to keep everything dry? You know, you have to, you're going to have to really think out the logistics of every step of what you're doing. The live rock, no problem. You can wrap it in wet paper towels or, or wet, wet newspaper. You can take a trash can and fill it 50% of the way with water and rock and put that in the back of your vehicle or your truck or whatever. It's a little different than the actual corals. And the corals, remember I was talking about the frag rack in a bucket. I was, the reason I was mentioning that is because you don't want your corals leaning on each other, touching each other. So that's why we like to individualize them, whether they go in small containers, bags, um, you know, some kind of dividers to keep them from hitting each other so there's no chemical warfare because they're going to be stressed from what you're doing and they're going to exude some stuff into the water. And the longer they are in that um, chemical soup, the more likely you could have some losses. So those are some of my thoughts, and I hope that it helps you a little bit with planning out how you want to do stuff. Oh, nice. Ryan says that he's got a decent quarantine where he has his automatic water change system set up, and it gravity drains from there to the sink. So it pulls water from the bottom of the quarantine and helps pull out the ammonia each day. I know some people that will take the water out of their reef, and they will use that for the new water into the quarantine tank, and that way they're always bringing water that direction and then they drain water from the quarantine tank to the to the you know the drain oh steve made a great suggestion with your quarantine tank make sure you have some kind of a top on there uh, a mesh top would be ideal because let's say you like buying wrasses they love to jump antheus can jump as well uh, so having some kind of a screen top is a, is a great idea thank you for bringing that up steve that was smart Uh, Thomas says, how can I keep the heat in my tank next week? We're getting a snowstorm. I don't have a generator. My tank is a 65 gallon. Well, if your house is staying the right temperature, you're not losing power, you'll have a heater in your tank and that will maintain it. If you have a power outage, the only thing you could really do since you don't have a generator is going to be to wrap the tank with blankets, to cocoon it, to trap the temperature inside. And then as soon as power is restored, you can unwrap it and make sure your heater is operational. Rob, thank you so much for the super chat. I really appreciate that. He says, wishing you a happy holidays and a great big thanks for everything you've done for us this past year. I'm happy to do it. I actually love doing our live streams each week. We have done a lot of them. I was going to write down the number because I happened to look it up recently. I think we've had something like over 200 live streams on this channel. <laughs> that is a lot. Steve says, hi from freezing UK, the coldest it's been in years. Uh, we had the worst freeze in 2020, right? That was the bad one? No, 2021. It was awful. And my 
my temperature was zero degrees on my watch, which that's insane. For Texas, that's insane. Um, your medic says, one of my fish has velvet. I'm moving all the fish to a hospital tank and following humble fish's um, advice. Do I need to take out my banded coral shrimp? And how often should I feed the coral in the display tank? No, you can leave your invertebrates in the tank. The, whatever's going on with your fish is a fish problem and a fish disease. So all the other invertebrates, anemones, shrimp, hermits, snails, leave all that there. It's fine. And then you can feed the tank twice a week. You could, you know, I don't know what size tank you have. You didn't mention that, but you can use your own reasoning. How much food do you think you need? It could be some flake food. It could be some pellet food. You could target feed some specific corals. You could broadcast feed with Benepet's Benareef. Um, you could broadcast feed with um, Polyp Labs uh, Reefroids, you know, like twice a week. Not much. And that way you're just kind of keeping enough food going for now until eventually these fish get back. Rick says he's late. Uh, by the way, did you guys hear about the giant aquarium in Berlin that exploded uh, and just flooded <clears throat> not only the lobby of the hotel, but then pushed everything out the front doors? I mean, it just wrecked the hotel. It was a quarter of a million gallons of water that just rushed out. And the thing just ex looks like it exploded. It doesn't look like a tank leak to me. It, I think what happened was some part of the support system just gave way. The tank was initially built in 2003, and so it was coming up on a 20-year anniversary. And apparently two years ago, they did some kind of restorative work on it to make it even better. But something went terribly wrong, and the entire thing ruptured. It was at 5.15 in the morning, so only two people happened to be in the vicinity of when this happened and were injured. But it wasn't like there was a lobby full of people which could have happened at like 8 or 9 a.m. So they were very lucky in that regard. But 1,500 fish ended up washed outside. They did try to capture some of the livestock, which was great. I mean, considering what that was. And they tried to put them in another section where they had livestock. But, you know, because it was all part of the facility. You know, they had another area. But because of the explosive nature of all this water flooding through the building, it knocked out the power, which knocked out the power to that other system too. So even those animals in that separate system were at risk now. So while they're moving stuff in, trying to save them, they also had to make sure those guys are gonna be okay. I don't know any more details than that, but um, terrible, terrible uh, story. And uh, if you haven't seen the news yet, it won't be hard to find. I don't know what this question is, Rob. What temperature would that peak out at in the bottle? I don't know what you're saying. Ask me again. <laughs> Hernando, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate it. Uh, I was reading recently about a way where I can change this to where it actually shows a cute little sticker instead of it, a description of the, <laughs> of the avatar. Hippo character's head pops out of water, surrounded by his hippo squad. But uh, yeah, my live stream does a description. It doesn't actually show the graphic, which is pretty funny. Let's see. Okay, Hernando says something good. Uh, you want to be careful the proximity of your quarantine tank near other tanks because through evaporation, there is a chance that it could spread illnesses and medications to other systems. Just like the tools you put in the quarantine tank, if you use the same tools in your reef, you could be transferring the, the disease. So it is ideal to have separate everything, but if you can't separate them, you have to have a cleaning system. When I worked in fast food as a teenager, we always had these sterilizer vats, uh, you know, just a container that had water in it and you added the sterilizer and then you'd put your hands in there to make sure your hands were clean of everything. And you could do the same thing, set up some kind of a sterilization option, like a bucket with, a, I don't know, vinegar, citric acid, whatever. And you could take those nets you just used and put them in that. And tongs and cutters and whatever you're using, put those in there to kind of clean them before they ever touch your tank again. And that would be a really smart move. 
Terry says, any updates on the enemy cube stand build? Much closer than ever before. Uh, Spencer says, what is that coral growing up the back next to the Vortec? That is a Tracy Morgan Gorgonian from the 20,000 gallon reef tank in Long Island. And I've had it for many years. When I got it, it was this tall, three fingers on one single branch. And I have fragged it many times and it's nice and tall, but it, it's not trying to outgrow the tank, which is nice. I don't have to do anything for it. It's just so self-sufficient. I don't have to worry about feeding it. I don't have to worry about giving it a certain amount of light. It's in a corner. It doesn't care. <laughs> and it just keeps growing. And it's got these beautiful polyps. I like it a lot. It's a tan color. It's nothing special. But um, it's really cool. <laughs> this is the first time I've seen this. The biggest reaper says, I'm the hundredth one here. Nice. Yeah, usually everyone's always like, first. Reefkeeper says, putting the heat pack outside the cooler would be if it's hot in your area and slightly cold in the area it's being shipped to. You put a small hole in the cooler so a little bit of heat gets in. I don't know. I think that's crazy. Rob wants to know how my Milo's Reef coffee mug is working out. Yeah, it's working out great. It just cools off. Hey, that was lukewarm. Not bad. Thanks for reminding me. Mike says, I just removed some nine-month-old plumbing from the tank. I had a decent population of vermited snails inside the pipes. Glad I used many unions on my plumbing so I can clean those out. Makes sense. Oh, man. Spencer says, I'm taking it upon myself to watch every live stream from oldest to the most recent. I do a lot of driving for work, and I am in between audiobook series, so I figured why not. You have hundreds of hours to go through, and some of it may sound kind of repetitive to you. I mean, the audience will even tell me in this chat, we know you've answered these questions over and over, and you just keep doing it. Because there's always someone new, and there's always someone that was distracted and just didn't hear it the first time, or the first 10 times. So I just keep readdressing those points, because there are certain things in this hobby that are forever. And then there's always new gear. But there are certain rules that just apply and apply and apply. And it really comes down to a mindset. You know, someone reached, uh, wrote to me last night and they said, hey, you know, thank you for everything you do. You've always been there to answer my questions. And I was like, it's literally how I'm wired. I can't even help it. And I've had people in my life say, are you a teacher? You know, is that your profession? I'm like, nope. <laughs> no, it's not. But I end up, I have some kind of weird educational vibe coming off of me rather than um, like a shock jock that just gets views. My stuff is just, you know, my stuff, my, uh, my channel, my, 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 my presence is just kind of a gradual, organic growth, very slow moving. <laughs> We're coming up close to 70,000 subscribers on this channel. And I do appreciate that. And I am not going to lie. I am jealous when I see other channels that get 100,000 subscribers. I'm like, how come I don't, you know? I mean, I don't need like a 30,000 sudden bump to make myself feel effective. But I just feel like the channel should be bigger by now. Because I have, according to YouTube, I've been doing this a super long time. And we have over 600 videos on this channel. That's a lot. Oh, here's a good question. Oh, okay. Rob says the greenish coral right next to the pump, that is a hammer coral. So if I get closer, we'll get into focus. This is all hammer. Underneath it is Duncan. Behind the hammer is a different type of Duncan. And then that's the Gorgonian in the back corner. Alex wanted to know, could we use a skimmer on a quarantine tank? You can, but there's probably not going to be enough dissolved organic compounds because all the water changes to literally pull anything out. I mean, you might pull something out, but I think it would be kind of a, a waste of space. I think just a hang on back filter is the better choice for a quarantine tank, honestly. Plus, you need a skimmer that is rated for that size tank. And typically, 
you know, I'm just uh, spitballing here. Typically, you're going to have somebody has like a, a skimmer just sitting in their garage that's rated for a 200 gallon. And putting that on a 20 gallon quarantine won't do much. And if it's an internal, like it's supposed to sit in a sump, it has to be at a certain height to operate. And there's that venturi where it's sucking in water where it could suck a fish against it and kill it. So I, I wouldn't put a, a skimmer on a quarantine tank. Oh, man. Keith says, thank you for your if you lose power chat. In New Hampshire, we're having a power outage from one to three days. Oh, I actually bought a generator after that chat. Well, I'm glad that everyone should own a generator. The amount of money that we spend creating these fantastic reefs behind us, you know, behind me, uh, you know, the ones that are in your home, the amount of money you spend on the lighting, on the gear, on the stand, if you want to, you know, make things high end, you know, and then you find these ridiculously expensive corals, and then you have no backup plan, <laughs> is the worst. You got to sit there and get some kind of generator. Even a small one is better than none. Uh, I, I have a video that's coming very soon about the battery backup system. My friend Mike, who helped me build it a year ago, he came over and we filmed a whole thing one Sunday. And he created this insane looking board. I cannot wait for you guys to see it. It is so over the top, so insanely ridiculous. And I love it. <laughs> and I hope you guys do too. I hope you don't sit there and uh, mock it because, I mean, he needed something that was going to do a very specific thing. And when you finally find out what he's using it for, you're like, wait, what? But anyway, it's really, really cool. <laughs> it will be in that video. I want to film a little more footage of my own battery backup system. I want to kind of explain it because I know when people watch this for the first time, they're probably going to say, well, how did you make yours, Mark? And I want to put more detail in there because I don't think there's enough. I think it kind of is too much of an overview and kind of, you know, we get to the nit nitty gritty of his contraption. But I want to explain what I'm using on my own tank because I think it would be something some might choose to emulate. And I'd like them to be able to have enough answers to actually recreate it and not be thinking, oh, he didn't explain any of this. So I'm like, I have to go through the footage and verify. Mina says, thank you for the Versa. I'll be dosing one milliliter of alkalinity per hour, totaling 24 milliliters a day. Is it possible on the Versa and what mode would I be using? Yes, you'll be using Mobius to talk to the Versa pump and then you would tell it how many milliliters for the day and how long the duration is and it will do the math. But ideally, it would be better for you to dose your alkalinity during the daytime rather than during the night. So, and the reason I'm saying that is because the corals absorb the alkalinity during the daytime. So if you can put it in during the day, it's best. If you, at the very least, put it in the morning because that's when your pH is at its lowest. So if you were dosing during the first three to four hours of the day, that would be smarter. You said you need 24 milliliters. You could put in six milliliters at 7 a.m., at 8 a.m., at 9 a.m., at 10 a.m., and be done. Instead of putting it in all around the clock, because during the night, nothing's absorbing the alkalinity. And if you literally put it in throughout a 24-hour period, you won't see the pH bump I'm talking about. Spencer says, what are your thoughts or experience with ozone? I have none. I only know that when the weather report warrants it's ozone alert day, don't go outside, don't mow your lawn, don't wash your car, I stay inside. Sixty-nine Joshua, sixty-nine Brown, sixty-nine. <laughs> nice choice of numbers. Uh, shout out from Canada, first time making it to one of your live streams. Well, I'm glad you're here. And here's a shout out from Texas back to you. Let's see. Rob says, speaking of books, what books would you recommend every reefer should have? Uh, I would really recommend that everyone have Coral Magazine subscription. Those are little mini books, and they come out every two months. I offer that magazine for my shop. If you want to buy anything, you can. Uh, let me scoot myself over here a little bit. And uh, the I get the latest issues. I have like five issues in stock right now. So it covers a lot of different topics, and each issue is kind of topic-specific through like five or six different authors. Lots of great pictures, lots of education. Of course, there's ads for the gear that we use. So I really, really recommend that one. Uh, other books, The Con Conscientious Marine Aquarist from Bob Fenner, or Robert Fenner. You should be able to find that on Amazon. That's an excellent book. Um, the, the, I can't see it. I think it's The Reef Aquarium, Volume 1, 2, and 3 from Two Little Fishies. They, they were the publishers of that book. 
excellent books to own. Um, there's a Reef and Vertebrates book from Anthony Calfo that came out 20 years ago. That's another good one. There's Corals by Eric Borman that shows you all the corals actually in the ocean. And there's so many in there, you'll never learn them all. There's so many. These are some of the highlight uh, books that I'd recommend. Yeah. Joshua says, what's your favorite nitrate test kit? API. <laughs> Dances with Fishes says, I hate to say it, bruh, but if you did another marathon daily diary and crashed your tank again, that puts you up to 100,000 uh, subscribers. That wasn't a crash. And number two, I didn't do that. It happened. It was a shock to me. I think I spent 12 days saying, I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> I finally figured it out. But yeah, I know what you're saying. Drama does bring out you know, the subscribers. I like my drama on TV. Thank you very much. Yeah, Robert is, Rob is saying if you were running a skimmer on a quarantine tank and you were using medication, it would pull out the meds. That's true. Uh, Dances with Fishes is recommending I get a purple tang. I, um... I don't know if I want a purple tang. Hang on, I gotta move something here. Let's shrink that down just a little bit. The um, the purple tang was semi-aggressive. I have the new Achilles tang. By the way, is it just me or does everyone own an Achilles tang now? <laughs> Every single tank I look at on Instagram has an Achilles. I'm like, I haven't seen these things anywhere. Now everyone has one. Alex says, what is the minimum tank size you would consider to use a calcium reactor? Oh, I'd say probably the smallest tank would be a 90 gallon because I've seen people do it with a tiny tank, which is insane. I mean, it just, it looks insane. I just ran into someone on my Facebook. He went by the username Lunch Bucket 20 years ago and he saw a picture of my reef and he made a comment and he signed it Lunch Bucket. I was like, oh my God, I haven't heard from you in forever. But he had a small tank on a stand. It was like a 29 gallon or something. And he had this huge calcium reactor on the floor next to it. And I kept thinking, oh my God, talk about overkill. Because you would like set that up with the media and a CO2 tank. And that one charged up system would probably do that tank for five years without touching it. <laughs> because you would never use enough for such a small tank. But no, a 90 gallon to 120 would make more sense. It really comes down to how much uh, two-part you're putting in daily. I find that a lot of times I will, and let me delve into two-part for a second because some people are not using it, in, are, are using it incorrectly. And so they keep putting more and more and more thinking this will correct it. And there's something wrong with the math. Uh, recently, I, I think it was on this live stream, someone said how they were putting in like 800 milliliters of alkaline and 800 milliliters of calcium every day or some craziness. And the tank wasn't that big. And I was trying to do the math, and I said, there's no way that you're using 800. And what that meant to me is that they're putting it in or they're dosing it in, and it's literally just turning uh, to, uh, it's solidifying and just falling to the bottom of the sump and just accumulating down there, and you have to clean out your sump. You're just wasting the chemical because the chemical is not mixing into the water column and getting up into the tank where it needs to be. It needs to be in an area of high flow. Jack needs to go outside. Be right back. Let me change this. How about if we put this up there? Yeah, there we go. Club Mulo's Reef, we've been around for four years and I highly recommend that you join it if you haven't already. We have some, just over 9,000 members right now and we are there to see pictures of your tank, answer your questions, just do more of what we do here on the live stream, but daily. So if you would like to be a member, please do join. And when you join, answer the three questions because if someone can't answer three questions, I just automatically hit delete I am the one that approves the people. We have a few moderators that make sure that everyone stays friendly and uh, they handle all of that so I don't have to. And I really appreciate that. Thank you, moderators. And uh, some of them actually are here in the live stream to assist with keeping the chat nice and clean. 
again, thank you to our moderators. They are great people, super, uh, super supportive. The amazing diver man is here. He has got great reception from down there at the bottom of the ocean. Hmm. Bob says, I went to clean my old 20-gallon 20, 20 to start up a tank and found a bad seam, and I'm debating a reseal or a new tank. Man, if it was me, I'd just get a new tank with a warranty. <laughs> See, I told you it's at the bottom of the ocean. What kind of product works best 300 feet under the sea? I don't know. A pitchfork? <laughs> a trident? And you're right, Spencer, that is true. That's why I keep doing these, these question and answers. Uh, he was saying, I find the questions asked in the live streams to be an invaluable source of knowledge. Many times questions are asked that I wouldn't have even thought of, but come in handy down the road. Um, so back in the day when I was on the forums all the time, I would write these big, long answers to people and, you know, hit enter. And I was helping that one person, but I knew I was helping 100 people that were lurking in the background that never asked a question or never had made a post in their life. They literally just read quietly in the background. Sometimes they read quietly because they're scared that if they ask a question, they'll be made fun of, or um, or it'll, it'll sound stupid, or whatever. Uh, just This just happened yesterday on Facebook, where someone asked a question, and I'm typing a huge answer to him, and then it said, we can't post this. I had a little red exclamation mark and a red box around my words. I was like, dang it, I just typed you this fantastic answer. So I went and sent him a PM and said, you deleted your thread, but here is my answer. <laughs> and he was like, okay, and we can't, he asked more questions, I answered them. But I've always considered there's lurkers. There's lurkers watching the videos. There's lurkers that are reading forums. And they may never say anything, but they're always having the opportunity to learn. That's why I don't believe in the two-word answers. I, I don't like to just say yes, no, a hundred, quote unquote, get me clean. You know, just things like that. I just feel like that doesn't help someone know how to use it. But if I can put a link that says, this is how I dose ChemiClean in my tank and how I handle the skimmer overflowing, and they have this paragraph they can read, they know what they're dealing with as they try to do it themselves. So I would really recommend and urge you to do the same when you communic communicate with others. Give them as much help as possible rather than the least amount of characters you can type in. We are not being charged by the letter on the internet. Um, the Amazing Diver Man says, what's your favorite oddball fish for a species-specific tank? Oh, man, that's a tough one. I'm, I'm leaning toward setting up some separate species tanks. I kind of like that idea. And uh, there are certain things I just want, but I don't know if they're oddballs. I really, really like a... Um, an angelfish from Lord Hoensis. Um, the, uh, uh, it's on the tip of my brain. <laughs> if it was on my tongue, I'd be saying it. Um, it's big. The body is gray. Um, it'll come to me, but I would, but you can get them made by Poma Labs. He, he grows them from eggs. And uh, you can get a little tiny one. And he's even done hybrids, mixing them up. And I was thinking, man, what if I set up a species tank and got that guy in there? What if I got a few really cool fish I would never be able to put in a reef tank and just enjoy them because they're all so beautiful? So I, I am kind of leaning that direction. There's Andrea. She's one of our moderators. Super helpful person, too. Brandon, congratulations. Graduating from college. That is awesome. Um, a gift to yourself. If you have the aquarium already, get yourself a shiny coral. That'll be your graduation gift to yourself. Aaron says, do you have an app you recommend for tracking testing? Yes, Reef Trace Live. It exists for iOS and for Android, so I don't know which camp you're in. Works on both. It's an awesome little app. It does way more than tracking your parameters. It also keeps track of notes. It sends you reminders that you need to do things like time to change the carbon, you know, or if you want to log when's the last time you put a brand new bottle of Nopox on your tank, 
you, you could look it up later and see, oh, I put it in on March. That explains why I'm out or whatever. So I really like that app for that. Plus it has a local fish store locator in there. So if you are anywhere near a fish store, it'll show up on the map when you open up the app wherever you happen to be at that moment. And you can, if you're at a store that doesn't exist in the app, you can actually submit it and make the map even better. So it's a great interactive uh, uh, app, Reef Trace Live. This person whose name I can definitely not pronounce says, I've been watching your videos from Ireland. First time I've caught you live and I love them. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm glad you're here. Uh, Dances with Fishes says, if you have an Achilles, I do recommend a purple tang. They are aggression equals in my tank, so balance out things and negate each other. I've had the Achilles almost two years and needs a buddy. <laughs> well, there it is right there. See it? No, you can't. I left that thing on the screen. Turn that off. Right there. Don't be in the shade. Come on. Ah, don't be that shy. So my water's been really good, but I've got a couple of spots where the corals have turned white, and I've been attributing it to uh, shade, that there's too much shade happening, and those corals that are completely blocked from the light, you know, the undergrowth, have turned white. But I hope it's not something more uh, uh, suspect. So I'm going to have to do some research and see what's going on in my tank. Uh, Lincoln Towns says, I found a nudibranch on my Zoa, and I'm pretty sure I know when it was introduced. How fast did they lay eggs? I don't know the answer to that. It could be the next day. It could be whenever they're ready. It could have happened already. It may not have happened yet. Dealer's choice. Okay, Jack needs to come in. Come on in. Good girl. I just bought Jack an ottoman today of her very own, a nice big one that is in front of the window so she can lie on top of it and look out the window and bark at the FedEx driver when he goes by. Um, the Amazing Diver Man says, what is something you only see in tanks five plus years old versus a, a year or two year old tank? Sometimes you'll see massive things that you would never see in a young tank. For example, I remember this one reef tank I was visiting. It was a 500-gallon tank and had been around for a long time. And he had a huge vermited snail tube in the front of the tank. I mean, just the tube. There was no worm in it. But the hole was like an inch and a half or whatever sticking out of the rock work. You know, I was just thinking the worm that made that, oh my God, where is that thing? But it was this giant, and I was like, you know, because it almost looked like it was a line to send water flow. And he goes, no, that was a pest. It's been removed. Like, wow, that's the kind of stuff. You'll see monster things that just had time to grow quietly and become huge. You don't usually encounter those in younger tanks. Uh, the other thing is you'll notice that the whole tank is kind of equalized. You don't have those weird areas that look new or um, uh, that... Uh, it just looks all grown in and looks mature. You can just tell. You can just look at it and just know. Um, this question was asked, any suggestions for keeping snails out of the skimmer? My snails are breeding like crazy and clog up the skimmer. Well, I don't know what kind of snail you have that has the ability to clog, but there are like screen intakes for pumps, and you might be able to rig something to the front of your protein skimmer but you'll have to still take that off and clean it, especially if it gets clogged up with snails there too. Anything that's clogging up the system, you gotta clean. But you could create that or some kind of a 3D printed something maybe that could become a mesh cover uh, that may assist. Or you know, make sure there's no snails down in your sump at all. Now, if your skimmer is hanging on the display tank, like a hang on back skimmer, don't have that ability. You're still gonna have to find some kind of mesh that you can put around the pump that sucks in the water that won't obstruct the intake that stops the skimmer from running. Uh, Trevor says, I've read about several people talking about slowly raising potassium levels with favorable color reactions. Have you ever tried elevating levels? Well, a year ago, I was missing a ton of potassium, so I did elevate it uh, over 200 ppm because I had to get it back to normal. And yes, it definitely added some beautiful color to my tank. The 
bottom number recommended by Just Incredible is 400 ppm, bare minimum, newbie or not. Those were his words in the video when we talked about potassium specifically on this channel. So I would suggest uh, finding out what your level is now and seeing if you need to raise it up some. Uh, I'm comfortable 400 to 450. That's where I'm keeping it. I'm not shooting higher, I'm not shooting lower. And that seems to have worked really, really well in my system. Alex says, can a generator be used in an apartment on the fourth floor? If it has a balcony and it's small, yes. And there are different kinds of generators. There are small little ones that look like little portable radios, basically. I mean, chunky, but like, a, or a toolbox, size of a toolbox. And you could put it out there and it, like I said, there's these quieter ones that aren't going to be nearly as obtrusive that can run. And then there's like normal gasoline powered ones that are bigger. And, but I mean, if there's a power outage, you have to have electricity for your aquarium. You just do it. And if you get yelled at, you just say, I'm sorry, I'm trying to keep my aquarium alive. But um, yeah, but if it's inside, you can't run the generator inside your apartment. It has to be outside because of the fumes. Uh, another choice would be a power inverter, which means you'd have to have a battery or two or three hooked up to an inverter. And then you plug in one or two things into that because the more water is being used, the faster those batteries are gonna deplete. Also, the choice of battery you buy, that matters too, because having those batteries indoors could be a health, a, a health risk. So we wanna make sure that you're not using something unsafe. If you can find a completely sealed battery, that would be best. And of course, you have to do proper storage with these batteries because you don't wanna have anything that could cause a potential fire risk one day. Trent says, let's see your shirt. This is from Lazy Coffee Designs. I love it, I'm wearing it every Saturday this month. So I wore it on the first live stream of, the, of this month, and then I wore it last week for our club event, which I can tell you about. And I'm wearing it today, and I'll wear it next Saturday, and I'll probably wear it the last Saturday of the month. And then I'll store it for next year, and hopefully I'll be a little thinner, and it'll um, look a little smoother on me in a year. Plaid Joker says, how do you quarantine coral? If so, how? Or do you quarantine coral? If so, how? I can't keep... Uh, even keep the pests out of my display, how would you keep them out of quarantine? Well, that's the point of quarantine. By putting the the coral in the quarantine tank, you can observe and deal with the pest. And if you need to, once done, you can sanitize the system completely now that your healthy coral has been moved back into the display tank. Uh, so really, quarantine is observation. It's not a medication tank. It's not a hospital tank. It's an observation tank, and it's just stable water where you can look and you can see things. And if you see something weird, you can siphon it out. You can pick it off. You can scrape it away. And you just keep observing it until you can't find any trace of that pest anymore. Then when you move it into your tank, you know you're moving in something safe. Some hobbyists go even more extreme. It doesn't matter what they buy. You know, it comes on a frag plug. They cut off the frag plug and they throw it away. And they just have the frag itself, which they've dipped in a coral chemical like Revive or One Dip or... Uh, one shot, um, there's something called Max Out. There's a lot of different choices on the market. And then they take that frag that's been freshly, chemically saturated, they'll rinse it, and then they will putty it to the rock work or, or use glue to glue it to the rock work. And they don't trust the frag plug itself because they feel like the pests could be on that and they just won't even take the chance. Plus they don't want to look at frag plugs in their tank. Terry suggests having a peacock mantis, peacock mantis shrimp for sure in a species tank. I don't want to do that. Swiss Frag Reefer, thanks for all you do for the reef community. I do love your content. Thank you. And since I'm half Swiss, I appreciate your post even more. You didn't even know that. Where are you in Switzerland? Thank you, Andrea. Conspiculatus angelfish. That is the one I've been wanting forever. And uh, Poma Labs is growing little tiny baby ones. And you know I love tiny fish. And if you didn't know that, now you know I love tiny fish. <laughs> uh, Mina says, my lights turn on at 10 a.m. Should I start the Versa dosing six milliliters at 10 a.m. with the lights or stick at 6 a.m. in the morning? Uh, 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 8 a.m., 9 a.m. You know, you could do that. You could do... Uh, 6 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock. I mean, there's that. 
You know, just kind of, it, I mean, if it was me, I would just put it all in at six and be done. I would just have my little thing happen, put in the 24 milliliters and be done with it. Uh, the people that have been dosing like around the clock and they have 400 doses, I'm like, wow, really? <laughs> really? I never have done that. I mean, think about it. I put in 90 milliliters of magnesium a day in my tank and I just have the pump set 90 milliliters and once a day, it just runs for about three minutes flat and then it's done. And my magnesium levels work. So I, you know, I don't see any reason for me to dose magnesium in pieces around the clock. And if I was to dose the uh, trace elements in a batch solution, I wouldn't be trickling that in throughout the day. I would, again, shoot it in the beginning of the lighting period and just let it happen. I don't know. We'll see. Triggerfish says, what do you have for a cleanup crew in Caitlin's Reef that won't eat the macroalgae? Well, I have one scarlet hermit crab, and I have five keyhole limpets that were hitchhikers. There's one baby brittle starfish that was a hitchhiker. And I recently introduced, like, I think it was eight Nasaria snails, which may have been a mistake. I mean, I like them. But one was dead. And I thought, what happened to the snail? Well, I have the Randall Gobi is now uh, matched up with a very tiny pistol shrimp that has doubled in size in like, I don't know, two months time. It's just insane. It's much bigger. And I hear it go snap. And I think maybe it's taken out my Nasaria snails, which is kind of a bummer because Nasaria snails help to clean the sand. I mean, they work their way through. And if this thing's just killing them off, that's kind of a bummer. But yeah, there's no urchins in there. I don't have a lot of hermit crabs. I don't have a bunch of snails. And the tank's okay. Uh, it's not gorgeous. And I'm wondering if I will steer away from the macroalgaes and just start planting in more corals to make it more pretty. You know, more zoanthids, lots of colorful stuff, and maybe more recordia. But I can show you what it looks like now. We're, we're using this um, special camera. Right now it's gonna be some weird stuff, but let me see if I can pivot this for you a little bit. Tighten this up, scooch this out of the way slightly. We're gonna do a pivot. And I'll probably have to get down there. Hang on, let me turn this thing that way so we can go like this. So you've got this red Valonia type stuff here, this tall red bubble algae. And then I've got a little bit of that flaky stuff. A lot of it got pulled loose during a water change. I have what looks like bryopsis happening in the backside of the tank. I'm not super happy about that. And there's a little bit down on the sand as well. So I've got to, you know, remove that. But yeah, I feel like if I were to put in a normal cleanup crew, then I wouldn't have any algaes at all. And I could just plant corals in there. And I kind of feel like I need something tall in the back. Like maybe a gorgonian could be in the back or some of the frammer that's in the back of my reef could go in the back corner, add a big pop of color, a big chunk of green, which would look nice and kind of pull away from, it's very muted looking. And I think it needs a little bit more. You can see the little angelfish. She's being shy right now, which is funny. And the Helfriki is in the very back. Yeah, it's a good little tank. was Rob says any experience with polyp lab genesis block I have no idea what that is T reefer says how many AI prime would you put on a 90 gallon tank none <clears throat> so the tank I just showed you that's an AI prime and I don't think it's strong enough and that's just 27 gallons so if you wanted to have three primes for a 90 you could but I don't think you'll get the depth. I mean, you said your tank is 24 inches tall, I assume. I don't know. Your, your maths is 48, 18, 24. So 48 long, 18 front to back, 24 tall? Or is it 48, 24, 18 tall? But this tank is maybe 20 inches tall. And I feel like it's not bright enough. So I would use something different. Maybe Kessel. And a couple of Kessels would be great. Like the A360X 
would be nice lights to put over there. Um, yeah, I, I don't think the Prime has enough juice. Maybe it does. Maybe if you just ran about 100%, you'd be happy. But uh, no guarantee that's going to work out in your favor. And when you run things at 100%, they, they get hot. Cooling fans get involved. I mean, there's just... It, things start wearing out. The Amazing Diver Man says, what equipment are you using to stream? Well, we're on an iMac 27 inch and we are using my iPhone 14 Pro as my continuity camera, which is kind of nice instead of having to set up the Nikon. And I'm using Ecamm Live software and I'm wearing the Samson uh, wireless lavalier microphone kit that has a receiver on my belt. And then on the back of the Mac, I have the, well, this is the sender. The receiver is plugged into the Mac, which is using a USB-C port as well as a USB port for power. And uh, I've got a couple of lights here that I got probably from the company Newer, N-E-E-W-A-R. And um, that's about it. It's, it's a pretty simple setup. Oh, I need to see what this is. Diacanthus Reef, oh, uh, yeah, Diacanthus Reef <laughs> talks about Genicanthus spinus. I'll look it up later. But I will take a screenshot so I don't forget to look it up. Watch, it'll end up being that fish that's in the picture of your avatar. But I don't know all my Latin, so if it is, joke's on me. Spencer says, have you finished the studio? Yes, it's 100% done. I love it. I work in there every single day. And I love coming in here, and the work is out there. And I have been super productive. I'm actually really proud of myself. I Currently, there's like six customers waiting for an order. Um, I am just like knocking them out of the park, and I'm trying to pre-build extra things. I'm trying to get to the point where I have a lot of inventory of acrylic products, you know, the bread and butter stuff, pre-made so when people order it, it like goes out the next day. And that is my goal. We'll see what happens. But 2023 is going to be a great year for Milo's Reef, I hope. And of course, I'll need y'all's support to make that happen. But yes, I think, it, I think it'll be better. This was a really hard year financially, and it was for everyone. But uh, this one made me nervous. <laughs> I stay nervous. Fortunately, I had a really nice transaction. Um, I can tell you guys, it's not a secret. So I have, okay, let me preface that with a quick commercial. I offer mentoring, which is a one-hour phone call. And we can do it pretty much any day or time you like. I mean, obviously, we have to work at logistics, but I offer these phone calls where I will help you one-on-one -on -one for $125 for that phone call. And if you are interested, it's available. If you don't want to do it, I understand. But some people said, I really need that hour. And last month I did um, two or three of those phone calls with people and we went longer than an hour. I didn't charge more. I just, you know, we kept talking and it was fine. But that allows me to see your system, answer your questions specifically, get you information that will help you solve whatever it is that's bothering you. So I've got a client who I've been helping now for over a year. We have a one hour phone call every single week. And he recently wanted a big project installed um, on site. And he asked me, you know, would I be willing to fly out and do it? And I said, yes. And yesterday I got my check. So I'm going to order all the gear and it's going to be shipped all to him. And then I will fly out there in the early part of January and I will go get it all set up for him. And um, so I, I do things like that. It's not very often, but it definitely helped my December month look a lot better on the books. <laughs> so I'm very happy about that. And, uh, you know, it's nice to be able to not only just talk about it, but I can demonstrate what I know as well for those clients that can, you know, afford it and want to do it. Nice. Richard says, you forced me. Yes, I love when I force people to make the Achilles Tang jump. I wanted one for over 15 years. Mine's on day 14. In the quarantine, you are staying on topic, sir. Good job. I'm so proud of you. I hope your Tang does fantastic. And then when you put it in your tank, I hope it's beautiful. What I'm really loving about this one, there he is. He's so small. And when Spock swims by and she's like this, and then the Achilles is like this. It's just a little fish compared to Spock. I love when they're together, which doesn't happen very often. It's all a matter of timing. But there's no fighting 
everyone's getting along. You haven't seen any kind of skirmishes in the background. And that makes me very, very happy because I want a happy, friendly reef. I don't like to see a lot of uh, hostility and, and definitely don't allow people, or people. <laughs> yes, I definitely don't allow people to bite me. <laughs> and I also don't allow my fish to bite me. Uh, Rob says, I hear there's a company that has developed a gl robot glass cleaner, just not the prototype they actually have started production. Oh, nice. That'll be cool. Yeah, I'd like to know more about that. Lincoln Town says, Honda makes a compact generator that's quiet too. Dances of Fishes says, Gener uh, Honda, Honda EU1000 is so quiet. See, perfect. Awesome. There you go, Alex. Trevor says, do you have any experience with powder blue tangs, personal or otherwise? Yes, I have tons of experience with powder blue tangs. So I had a fantastic, gorgeous specimen of fish for about five years. It was in my 280-gallon 280, 280 reef, talking faster than my lips will form the words. And it was very aggressive, but it was such an ick magnet. Literally, I would just it would get stressed for no reason whatsoever and just be covered in ick. And you're like, oh my God. And not one of the fish in the tank had ick, right? But it would just be like snowstorm on its body. And then the next day, powder blue, perfect fish, no ick. <laughs> like it retracted the ick into itself again. And then it just sticks it out like a porcupine does with its quills. It was the weirdest fish ever. But I never did anything about it because I saw no issue. There was no ick spread into my tank. The, the powder blue wasn't freaking out. It just was this very, very weird scenario. And it's just how it lived its life. I'm like, all right, you got allergies. I mean, I don't know what else to say about this fish. It was really, really pretty. And I did not realize until it was gone that it was actually causing a problem in my tank with one specific coral, which was the toadstool leather. So I had this toadstool leather. I went to Macna um, in the early 2000s and there was a, a fragging workshop and they took a leather coral and they put it up on a table in the front of the room. And then there was all these tables in the room and everyone had a seat at their table with some fragging tools in the middle of the table. And we, it was a workshop. Everyone got to try it. And so they took this leather and they used some kind of a, uh, probably a scalpel, and they cut the meat off the top rim of the leather all the way around, like a one inch donut. They just trimmed it off and they said, the rest of the coral goes back in the tank. It's fine. It'll heal. We're just going to take frags from this donut. And then he took the donut and he cut it into sections, of, I don't know, eight inches long. And he, every table got that chunk of leather put in front of them. And then you got to take it out of the tray of water, put it on your little cutting board and cut off a little chunk, a little nugget of meat. And then you'd rubber band it to a frag plug and you got to take it home. So I came home with this piece of toadstool leather, no bigger than the tip of my pinky. And it was on a rubber band and I stuck it in my tank. And it just grew and it got bigger and it just looked like a lump of meat. <laughs> and uh, it was fine. I mean, it just, it just, it, it went, it got taller and thicker and it grew the mushroom head. But that was about it. And occasionally I'd see a polyp come out and the, the uh, powder blue tang, see, I'm coming back to the story. I didn't get lost. And it would quickly like gnaw and bite at those polyps. It, like, it's like four daisies sticking out of the toadstool meat. And it was like, nom, 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 nom. And they just retract or get bit off or whatever happens with a powder blue tang. I don't know. And so this coral always looked like that. And I just thought that's its normal look. So now the story takes a really negative turn. Um, there was one night. So I had sun corals in the tank. And I would always feed them by hand. So I would stop all the flow in the tank. I had my little bowl of mini mysis that's been thawed out. I would take a pipette. I would slurp some up by the bowl. I'd reach my arm all the way down to the bottom and I would squirt the food onto the sun coral polyps that are ready and, ready, ready and waiting to eat. And after five minutes, I would come back and put more food on all those polyps. And then after five minutes, I'd do it again. So basically I got th fed three times in a row during a 15 minute period after lights out. And I've been doing this for a long time. Well, one night I took my little bowl of food and I put it on top of the tank to thaw. And then, I don't know, I got distracted. I washed some dishes or I did some laundry or what I had TV on. I don't know what I did. But all I know is like, I'm tired. Oh wait, one more thing I didn't mention. I put the food on top of the tank to thaw 
and I turned off all the pumps for all the flow. Then I got distracted, forgot what I was doing, decided I'm tired, I'm going to bed, and I went to sleep, and the tank was turned off. I mean, all the power was turned off to the flow. There was no pump from the Tunzies or from Vortex, or nothing was flowing, no return pump, nothing. And I was supposed to be feeding sun corals and forgot what I was doing. I woke up the next morning, and the water was like this low in the tank, you know, from the rim, and I was like, oh no, I, I forgot to turn on the return pump. And all my fish were on the bottom of the tank on the sand bed. A lot of them were dead and others were dying. And I was like, oh my God, I literally forgot that I was going to feed the sun corals. And I looked up and there was that bowl of fish food and sitting there all night. And so I lost the powder blue tang along with a beautiful flame angel, a long nose hogfish. Um, uh, I can't even think what else it was, you know, probably coral beauty or something. I mean, I lost a lot of fish. Spock was like oxygen deprived drunk and her, her mouth was in the sand and her body was up at an angle and I would turn on the flow and she kind of started to, I don't know, get her consciousness back and she was just swimming directly into corals like a bulldozer and just like slam into this, slam into that, slam because she couldn't see yet. And I mean, I thought she was going to die too. I mean, I had... I was a miracle that half my fish lived. It was such a terrible mistake on my part. Never made that mistake again, ever. I mean, you just learn from mistakes and you never do it twice. But um, all those fish that had died, as I took them out of the reef, I got to finally see what size they were in my hand. I was like, oh my God, this powder blue was massive. This flame angel was ginormous. I mean, they were huge fish and they were all super colorful, all super healthy. There was nothing wrong with them. And as I'm looking at these fish, I mean, I feel like they must have just died like minutes before I woke up. Like they went as long as they could because there was no decay, no worms had bit on them or snails or anything. nothing had happened to them. They were in perfect condition, just not alive. Super sad day. It was a terrible mistake. Well, besides being devastated, I, you know, I was a big poster on Reef Central at that time. And I had an avatar that had this, uh, this first anemone I'd ever had with clownfish in it. So I put that black bar across the avatar, like, you know, the police put on their arm when one of their uh, members dies. And um, I just left that on my profile for a couple of months because I was just so upset with myself for being so stupid. Well, the tank, of course, the corals didn't care at all. They were 100% perfect. The remaining fish all completely came through. They survived. You know, Spock is still with me to this day. The purple tang was another one that lived through that. Um... Clownfish lived through it. I mean, it was a lot of fish that did, but I'd lost quite a few. Well, since the powder blue was no longer in my tank, that toadstool leather turned into something beautiful. I mean, it was absolutely gorgeous. Let me see if I can find you guys my article about the toadstool leather. Give me a second here. Coral of the week, toadstool leather, Milev. There it is. All right. So I wrote this article years ago. Let's see if I can share it to you guys. And I want to zoom. There we go. So this is Reef Addicts. This is my other website, by the way. <laughs> it's been going forever. And here is my beautiful toadstool leather with a lawnmower blenny. And all those polyps are out. There is my chunk of leather that came home from Macna the size of my pinky, rubber banded to a piece of rock. This is another toadstool leather with green polyps that someone gave me as an example for the article. But I just wanted to show you how pretty the toadstool leather is. Look at this little, it, it, the polyps sway back and forth like wheat in a field. It's absolutely stunning. And look how big this coral was in my tank. Let's see, it's off the screen a little bit. I need to scooch this over. Hang on, give me a second to figure this out. Oh, I see. I got half my window off the screen. <laughs> but in this picture right here, the vertical shot, you can see Spock back then. Just probably, I don't know the date of this article. I'd have to look. But you can see how big the leather was grown from that little tiny nugget. 
And down below, look at the leather compared to those clownfish. This tank was 30 inches front to back, and look at the leather. It's like 24 inches across. It was literally the showpiece in my reef. It took up probably a third of my tank. Minimum a quarter, but probably a third. That was my reef back in the day. I love my 280 gallon tank. It's actually in a book. Uh, it was featured in there along with a lot of other beautiful reef, beautiful reef tanks around the world. So, yeah. So that's when I learned, uh, I'm looking at the dates. So this was done in 2010, that was my article. Um, so I probably got the frag probably four years before that. All right. So there was my answer about powder blue tanks. <laughs> Talk about stretching out the story, right? Perfect for those of you driving a car. But if you're driving a car, you didn't see any of the pictures I shared. But anyway, yeah, no powder blue tang allowed this coral to blossom into something fantastic and beautiful to look at. And I was very, very, very happy with that coral. It kind of made up for the loss of the fish in a little bit. I mean, the powder blue was st stunning. I love a nice, thick, healthy powder blue tang. But that leather was fantastic. So I would recommend that to anyone. Ramon says, I would like to add a second tank using my existing sump. Will adding a second tank affect the current tank? Yes and no. Uh, number one, the second tank, if you like were feeding it really heavily, like let's say it needed, let's say it was a puffer and you're feeding it lots of food and it's, it's a messy fish, it's a lot of waste, all that pollutant could literally end up affecting your main reef that has this pristine water because you have this constant amount of biological waste happening in the secondary tank. The other thing that could happen is you, you have to test this, obviously. You gotta pull the plug on your return pumps, yes, two, and see what happens. Will the sump hold all the water or will the sump overflow? You wanna have the sump big enough to handle two aquariums that are both plumbed into it so that way your floor stays dry in a power outage or a pump failure. And the reason you want two return pumps is because one is going to feed one tank, it's going to drain at whatever rate it needs to be. The other pump is the other tank, which drains at its rate. If you wanted one common pump that feeds both tanks, you could do it. You would just have to adjust your valves on the drains to make both tanks quiet. Uh, but the most important thing is making sure the sump can hold all of the water in a power outage. And it's super easy to find out, but you literally want to pull the power on the return pump as well as the protein skimmer because in a power outage, those are the two things that will drain down immediately. And any water in the pipes and any siphon that's happening with the tanks will also come down those pipes as well. And you don't want a wet floor. So you want to know that. And then, yeah, like I said before, it just depends what kind of food you're putting in tank number two. Could it affect the tank number one or is it all fine? And it's just, you're, you're good at feeding both tanks equally and you're not going to overdo it. Those are two thoughts that come to mind. Rob says, that's why you're so handy with everything. You're Swiss. I am. Uh, Spencer says, speaking of tiny fish, how do you feel about the flaming prawn goby? Gorgeous. Definitely needs its own little um, species tank. They're so tiny. Oh, thanks, Rob. I appreciate that. He says, Caitlin's Reef is perfect. <clears throat> Triggerfish says, did you get any crabs with your Gulf Live Rock order? No, I did not see any crabs. I really love the limpets, though. And yesterday, I took out the Nero 5, and when I did, I, I pulled out the pump, and I kind of cleaned it in tank because of the cord, and then the back half, which is like a screen, and the magnet came with me to the kitchen sink. And as I was brushing off all the leaves of algae that got stuck and trapped on the grid, I heard this tink sound of something like stone hitting metal, and it was the limpet. And it went tink, and I was like, oh no. So I brought it right back over here. So it actually got hit with some fresh water accidentally, but I brought it back to the tank and put it on top of the cleaning magnet, and it just crawled away. So I did not kill it, which I'm very happy about, because I should have noticed, I just forgot. But I was very, um, I wanted to clean up the pump, clean the heater, clean the air stone. That tank now, I think it's coming up on six months old. And there's this big ceramic airstone about this tall. 
So I took it out and I really brushed it with a Battle Corals toothbrush. Have you guys seen that thing? It's a really nice scrubbing brush. The bristles are hard. And I really scrubbed the ceramic and I've got a really nice set of bubbles coming off that stone right now. Eventually I'll have to get a new airstone. I hope I can find that one again because I really like that style. Triggerfish says you should get one of the 10 pack rock flower anemones from Hellfire Frags. I believe they're on sale. I'm trying not to put anything in there that can eat a $2,000 angelfish right now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I, I look for things that are friendlier. RG Reef says, what size quarantine would you recommend for tangs? If you buy little tiny tangs, a 20 gallon is fine. If you're getting a tang that's this size, you might want to set up a 55 gallon because the tang will eat a lot and poop a lot and that will affect the water quality even with a 55 gallon uh, rapidly. The ammonia levels will rise. Oh, I forgot to mention ammonia with your quarantine tank. Um, if you're still listening an hour later, I hope that you'll know to at least put in an ammonia alert badge inside the tank to kind of keep an eye on that because you do not want ammonia to surprise you. But if the tank is running well and you're doing your daily water changes of that 10 to 20%, 10% minimum, if you're changing 10% a day and you've got a filter on there, odds are ammonia will not get away from you. Because like I said you're, earlier, you are going to change 100% of the water every 10 days. And that means ammonia can never have a chance to escalate rapidly. You would have to do something insane, like have a 20 gallon long and put in 15 fish. That, of course, is a whole other argument. And that was not anything like what I described at the beginning about coming home with a new fish and putting it through safety stop and then putting it into your quarantine tank. Swiss Frag Reefer says um, he knew I was somehow connected to Switzerland. I saw t-shirts, beer bottles, Swiss things in your videos. I'm from Lucerne, but now live in Nashville, Tennessee. I grew up in Basel, and I visited Lucerne several times. Jason Lang, yes. He said, I ordered the peace, uh, Peacemaker, and it shipped the next day. Works great for myself and in introduction into my tank. The reason you're shipped the next day is because I had it built in advance. And that's my goal. I want to build a bunch of those and have them ready to rock and roll. Julian Stamp says, never do anything to your tank after 8 p.m. when you're tired. Or set a timer to remind you of what you've done. Or use a virtual switch with your Apex that if you turn off all the pumps, they're going to resume automatically anyway after a certain period has elapsed, like 20 minutes, 45 minutes, whatever it is. In my case, I literally basically turn things off. And then my job would be feed the corals and then 10 minutes later walk over and turn them on. And I just had a brain fart. It was stupid. All right, guys, we've been talking for almost two hours. Let's go ahead and wrap this up. It is Water Test Saturday. Do not hang up yet. Watch to the end. Uh, it's Water Test Saturday. Please do test your tank for all the parameters. Water tests save lives is exactly what Caitlin said in the beginning. I love it. I need to put it on a t-shirt. I need to wear it on the stream for you guys. Or maybe I'll put on a ball cap where it says it on the cap. And during this segment, I'll put on my water testing cap for y'all. But we want to definitely test our water, make sure everything's good right now. Even though the tank looks fine, let's make sure it is fine. So that way there's no surprises and you won't have to suddenly start doing damage control because something got away from you because you weren't paying attention. I just checked my uh, nitrate on my tank a couple days ago because I was curious. I was like, what is my nitrate right now? Because it's been vicious. And it came back around 60. So somehow it's slowly coming down. I still don't know what made it go up. <laughs> I don't even have a good theory. I don't get it. But it's coming down. And that's the right goal. And I'd like to see them come down lower, obviously. And we're going to see what happens as they head into 2023. Um... But we want to test alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, if you have it, potassium. It's a really important one. Of course, nitrate and phosphate are important for nutrients and to keep things from getting out of hand, like dinoflagellates, cyanobacteria, uh, even diatom blooms and stuff can happen from things being in, in an imbalance. And of course, you could be losing corals, random deaths that you can't explain because something is lacking in your water parameters. So I want to make sure all these big ones are right. Uh, you want to check your temperature, make sure it's stable around the clock. Kind of, you know, if you happen to get up at 3 in the morning because you're hungry or whatever, check the tank temperature. Just walk over there and look. If you don't have a controller that tells you, 
go check your tank temperature and see if it's still the right temperature at 3 a.m. like it is at 3 in the afternoon because you don't want your tank cooling off too much at night. Check your salinity, double check your salinity, calibrate the device you're using to measure salinity so you actually know it's the real number because if the salinity gets too high, corals close up. If they get too low, corals start dying. We wanna make sure those numbers are accurate. And um, yeah, those are the things we test. And if you'll do that, you will end up having a beautiful reef tank that you can share with all your friends on YouTube too. I hope you guys have a great rest of your weekend and I will see you again next Saturday, I think. Bye.